hello, hi. Uh, I, I, I want to first just thank uh, designers and geeks uh, team for making this possible. Thank you so much. Really grateful for this opportunity. So, uh, so hola, I'm Pablo, diseñador. Uh, diseñador. So the, the, say diseñador with me. One, two, three. Diseñador. Now uh, all the women say diseñadora. Diseñadora. There you go. We can just do Spanish class right now. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> next time, next time, okay? I'm invited, okay. Uh, so, uh, so today the theme is about uh, visions of the future. And I, I suppose when we think of the future, maybe we imagine a shiny, all glass and metal dream uh, with flying cars, robots doing our dishes, and probably hoverboards and floating cities. Uh, well, for me, the future, I, I imagine it a little bit more boring, uh, but uh, a kind of like what it is right now, but hopefully, hopefully a little bit more inclusive. A future in which we use or design superpowers of empathy to design for people with different abilities. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be uh, prepare us for that future. Uh, we're going to talk about accessibility and we're gonna keep it practical with some steps and tips and just focus on web design. So uh, first things first, let's talk about what I'm, <laughs> what I'm talking about. Uh, digital accessibility refers to building digital content applications that can be used by a wide range of people and regardless of their abilities. So generally speaking, accessibility concerns uh, can be split into four broad categories. So these categories are uh, visual, uh, auditory, motor, and cognitive. Uh, so just those. And also there are certain principles that the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines uh, puts. And this is uh, that is perceivable, operable, operable. Oh my God, my, my Spanish. Whenever th there's a word in Spanish that sounds very similar to in English, I just like say it in Spanish in my head. Anyway, operable, understandable, and robust. So. Before, and uh, all of this information, by the way, it's out there, it's on the web, and, and you can just research it, and it's, uh, 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 th that's what I did to be here. So I invite you to do that. Uh, right now, we're going to start first with some story time, okay? Uh, just to, to get you here, uh, I'm, we're gonna go back in time, in the year 2000, uh, when I was uh, probably, I was like 18, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm old. Uh, so back then, I used to work at a print shop. And uh, this was like a, uh, those print shops, they, they would focus on large format prints. So banner, decals on cars, indoor and outdoor signs on, on stores. I, I used to do a lot of cars with flames. Uh, and, and the funny thing is that usually it were, <laughs> they were usually crappy cars, but the the guys, they were usually guys, uh, they just wanted flames in their cars. So I don't know, they, they, so they looked a little faster. So uh, we had a big project in our little store and a big company back in my, uh, back in my company, sorry, back in my city where, where I'm from, uh, they, uh, there is this uh, hardware store called Proconsa. And Proconsa is like the Mexican Home Depot and they were opening a new store. So you can imagine like this giant store with tons of signs inside and tons of signs outside. So signage, window decals, hanging signs, everything, all the, all the works were doing all of that. So, and Proconsa had this very strong brand and, and just like a very recognizable uh, color, which was orange. We all, back in Mexicali, back in my hometown, we all knew that uh, Proconsa's color was orange. So. I go and I prepare everything. Uh, back then we used vinyl to just, well, I'm supposed you, you still do it that way. Uh, vinyl and just like I prepare everything on the computer. So uh, by the way, check, check out my dope monitor. That's how it was before. And, and that was like a, one of those towers from Mac, uh, the, the big ones, metal ones, yeah. Uh, so I prepare everything and, and, and and by the way, I used to go to college then, and so I, I would do it in the afternoon because I would go to college in the morning. I would do it in the afternoons to prepare for the people next morning so they would like have everything printed already and they would just start putting it on the signs. So I do everything. I was very proud of myself, by the way, because this huge project. So I had everything ready. I went home late and everything in bright orange. So 
Next day, I come and just like there was no 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 one was working on it, and and it was just like that. And uh, uh, I was a little bit worried because usually people are like actually putting stuff in in in, in science and putting it on, on all that stuff. So there's a lot of movement, and there was no movement, so I was a little bit worried. So I hear someone, my the the project manager, I suppose, uh, he's just like Pablo. He sees me from the corner, and. He shouts at me and he's like, what happened here? And I didn't know. So one of the most common mistakes that I would make uh, usually is with sizes. You know, if you miss a size, then you can, everything is, is screwed. So I was like, crap, probably I mixed centimeters with inches or something and everything is, is wrong. So I thought that was what's, what's going on. So he says like, but I seriously didn't know, so I was confused. I don't know what, what's going on. He was like, look at that, <laughs> pointing at the orange stuff. So I was like, L -l -l what? <laughs> look at what? Uh, so what color is it? And I was a little bit confused because, well, we all knew it was Proconsa, so it was orange. So I was like, well, it's, it's orange, of course. And he told me, no, <laughs> it's green, <laughs> which was really weird for me. I thought he was a little bit crazy. So I was like, because it looked orange to me. And then I even said, hey, don't worry about this. I got this. Let's look at my computer, because probably there was a mistake in the printing and all that stuff. So I was like, see, I opened the file. And I was like, see, it's orange, <laughs> thinking I was redeemed. And he was like, no, that's green too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how I found out that I was colorblind. <laughs> so they, they were pretty cool about it and they, they didn't fire me even though it was a huge thing. They did check on, on everything on me like from then on. Like uh, I would go with them and I still do it by the way. I was still like, it, it, does this look water blue? And I suppose it's not blue, right? It's not blue. Uh, so uh, over time I understood like how to use color and just like paint by numbers pretty much. So now I see like colorblindness kind of like my superpower. If something looks good to me, I assume that it will look good to most of people. Uh, and this, is, this in part has led me to care more about accessibility too. Uh, and in a selfish way, I'm doing this so the web also looks better for me. So that's the story time. Just a little bit of context of why uh, I care a little bit about accessibility. Uh, so today, on today's menu, we're going to go over seven easy to implement guidelines to create more accessible work, some practical tips, and we're going to be focused on web products. Uh, but some of these outlines can also be applied to mobile app products. So first we're gonna start with the myth, why, guidelines, and hopefully some takeaways. So let's start with the premise with this. Designing for accessibility is not that hard. Now please, say it with me. Designing for accessibility is not that hard. Okay, now say it again, now okay. Okay, <laughs> the thing is that there's a myth that designing for accessibility, there's some misconceptions that exist out there. And usually is that, hey, uh, I don't know, it's so hard, we gotta move quick, we got no money, we gotta, uh, there's no time. And, and, and yes, I use Comic Sans, because I hope that reflects how much I value those opinions. Um, so I think that, uh, uh, that when, you, uh, when it, it can be framed as a, workflow, as a workflow problem and not uh, uh, when accessibility is just part of your process, part of your workflow and design process, just meeting the requirements that are necessary for, uh, for, for meeting accessibility, then they don't add extra features or content. Therefore, the additional cost and effort should be minimal. But the mid is pretty persistent. So one of the most difficult parts that I found is not really applying uh, accessibility guidelines, it's more uh, when you're trying to fix something that is already there and you're starting, to, you're starting to fight culture and sometimes you start to fight people. So a product that doesn't have the resources, designers that don't want to lose their nice shades of color, or and tiny fonts and leadership that just doesn't understand why. So let's actually talk about that. Let's talk about the why. And I think that as designers, we have the power and responsibility to make sure that everyone has access, uh, regardless of ability, context, or situation. And we must design products that provide, well, equal access and opportunity for all people, no matter of their capabilities. 
And accessible products, uh, the great thing about making products that are accessible is that it brings a better experience to everyone. And, and that is a huge advantage. And, and I'm going to put this uh, very simple example uh, that I really like, and it's just like an accessibility ramp. Uh, it originally designed for people using a wheelchair, uh, able to uh, access sidewalks, uh, but it also helps other people. A dad with a stroller, or a bike rider, or someone that, uh, people in scooters. <laughs> Don't ride those on sidewalks, please. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and, and now let's take a look at some numbers. There are over 56 million people in the United States, uh, nearly one in five, uh, that, uh, people who have a disability. So uh, they're over, yeah, there you go. And that's over one billion worldwide. And let's just talk about like blindness or vision problems. And an analysis in 1999 revealed that blindness or vision problems to be among the top 10 disabilities among adults age 18 and older. And there's some information there if you wanna check it out. And this uh, impedes the ability to read, drive, prepare meals, and, and, and sometimes also social isolation, uh, according to the study. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, uh, no, <laughs> I'm kidding on this, but hopefully you're feeling guilty. No, <laughs> no, but uh, I'm kidding. This is not to make you feel sorry for people. This is uh, it's just to build some empathy and, and, and just hopefully want to get to your hearts and that apply to your design process. But let's say that you're a psychopath. They say that you just don't care about people. <laughs> And I can understand that you just have no empathy and you just care, probably you care about money. And, and, and that's, that's your thing, you know? So let's, I want to tell you that there's also a strong business case for accessibility. Uh, when you build with accessibility, then uh, you have better search results. Uh, you, have, uh, uh, you can reach a bigger audience. Uh, they're SEO friendly and faster download time. And usually they're always have better usability. By the way, this is just a number from 2017. I don't have the up updated on 2018. Uh, it should come soon. But in 2017, there were uh, 814 lawsuits on, on website accessibility. By the first six months of 2018, there were already 1,053 lawsuits against uh, uh, people in, in, in web accessibility. So uh, that can also be another way to convince your boss to do this. Okay, seven guidelines. <laughs> yeah, we use fear. Uh, seven guidelines, and this is to just to meet uh, uh, the double A of web content, uh, accessibility guidelines. And this includes uh, using screen readers, uh, keyboards, uh, screen magnifiers, and speech recognition tools. So pretty basic, and that's the idea here that a lot of these things are so basic and so obvious uh, and we're gonna start with one of the most obvious ones, which is uh, checking your contrast. And the thing is that enough contrast between, you want to have enough contrast between your text and the background colors. So you go from something that looks pr probably pretty, uh, but it's harder to read for some people. So you change the contrast of the color and then uh, you still have a pretty color, but it's just a little bit more readable. And here, it's, that's the ratio that you want to achieve just to get to uh, conformance level AA. And that's 4.15 to one. That means that uh, uh, the contrast ratio between the background and the text should be that. And according, uh, the contrast ratio is like that. And this guidance is only to provide enough contrast to people with low vision that can read your content. So here, right now, this one is at 2.3. But if we were to change it, then we could achieve 4.5. And it would still look good. So here's, uh, here's an example of how, how to get those colors. For example, this is just with a white color and a color background. So everything that is below the line is accessible. It's meeting the, the conformance level. Uh, so uh, this is a tool, uh, you can use it on, 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 on Chrome. Uh, but this is a, telling you, like by the way, you see how in the greens and on the oranges it's really hard to get uh, to get to conformance level, but what is red or blues, those are easier. Probably that's why we have so many brands using those colors. See how all that, it gets the contrast. Now, uh, when uh, the ratios become more forgiving with larger and heavier fonts, so those are like three to one. Uh, here we see this text where it's uh, 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 just a normal font. Uh, there's a 14 pixels. It fails, but if you make it a little bit bigger, 
and you change the weight, then it passes. This is another tool that is out there. This is uh, it's called Colorable, and it's uh, telling you in life uh, if you are passing or not conformance levels. Another tool that, can, that might help you just build a color palette is from Colorbox by Lift Design. This uh, actually creates all of those colors are accessible uh, and, and, and with a combination from black and white. So a uh, pretty useful tool. Uh, let's really quickly, uh, uh, let's test, uh, I work at Envision. And in Envision we're working on a design tool called Studio. And, and you can also uh, pl use plugins as apps. And we're actually working on one. I'm going to open it, screw it. Okay. So hold on. Hopefully this, it's, it's uh, the app is still on beta, so probably it will break. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for example, here I have a test. So I have some text here, and this is I'm going to test my app. So open plugin content, and here we're working on a tool that can give you in context right there. Uh, analyze. Oh, what happened? Oh my God! You cannot see my screen. That sucks. Hold on, how can I do this? <gasps> What's going on? Oh, you know what? I'm going to do mirror. Yeah, I, I see what's going on. I'm sorry about that. I, I got it, 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 I got it. Okay, so hold on. There you go. So, okay, so here we have the, uh, uh, we're opening studio. And right away, uh, we see that this, uh, I want to test right now on my document if it's, uh, I'm using accessible colors. So I analyze the page and it's telling me, hey, you know what? Uh, something is, 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 is weird happening here. So I can just start like playing around with probably the luminance, probably the saturation, and it's telling me right there if it's passing or not. And then it just tells me, you know what? Yeah, you passed. Okay. Let me do real quickly, do the other thing, and remove the mirror, and let's go back to my presentation. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to run out of time real, real soon. So okay, first, uh, second thing is don't just use color. And the thing here is don't just use color alone to make critical information understandable. Uh, when you're communicating something that is important, showing an action or prompting a response, don't just use color. Uh, the idea is that color can, not, can be probably not as accessible. So here are some examples of uh, two of the best design apps out there uh, from, uh, from Airbnb and from Spotify. Uh, the thing here is that for uh, people with color blindness, uh, it's really hard to understand which of these tabs is actually selected. Uh, so here when it's actually bigger, it's, it's, it's really clear, but in a small screen, it's really difficult to know if it's on shuffle, if it's on repeat for someone like me. Uh, so one easy thing to do that actually, I think uh, Spotify just changed it, that it's uh, adding an indicator, just like that. With that indicator, now it's telling you, hey, you know what? Uh, it's not only the color that is telling you that it's active, something else changed in the UI, and now it's telling you, hey, something happened there. So try to use other indicators. Just as text labels. For example, here on this form, uh, we've shown uh, probably error message. That's red, right? Yeah, it's red. So uh, the red is really hard for me to understand that there's an error there. Uh, use an emoji. I don't know. Use an icon or something. And if you want to uh, be a little bit more clear and obvious, use a label. And here is uh, just a comparison from Something that is not obvious at all for someone with color blindness. Something that is, okay, I'm understanding where the problem is. And over there is telling me, okay, please understand now. Another thing, text and paragraph. Here is super hard to, 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 to see where the links are. Uh, so real quick, underline, use your own thing. I'm pretty sure you can come up with something more creative than that. Uh, probably even making bold. Uh, but that just helps a lot. Another thing, just graphs. Uh, here it's really, really hard to match these colors and these colors. I, I don't know which one is which. So really easy, just use an icon and then suddenly they even look better. So now I tell you that the fire is over here, the eyes are over there. And if you want to go even a step further, just uh, add a little bit of texture. Uh, 
the texture really helps. It just like makes makes it even way, way, way more obvious. An example of this in the wild is from Trello. They have a colorblind friendly uh, mode that actually changes the labels. Instead of just using color, they add a little bit of texture too, which is pretty cool. And you can see it here too, applied. Okay, third one. How are we on time? Eh, almost there. Okay, design focus states. This is really important. Uh, when you are navigating your site, you might find that the default focus states are not very pretty, and, but don't be tempted to just hide them. Sometimes we forget to design the states and we're just surprised when we see them implemented. It's like, oh, what is that? Uh, they look something like this, and I don't know if you noticed, and just like a, this blue outline. Actually, uh, different browsers uh, show different uh, the default uh, indicators. Uh, so, uh, so, however, if you get rid of this default style, be sure with, to replace it with something else. Uh, who needs focus indicators? Uh, uh, focus indicators help people know which element has the keyboard focus and help them understand where they are when they're navigating a site. They're used for, uh, by people who are blind and require screen readers, individuals with uh, 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 limited mobility that are just using the keyboard. Uh, and, and some of us, they're just like a, they're power users and just want to navigate the web with a keyboard. So, what needs focus indicators are just like the things that you interact with, which are links, form fields, widgets, buttons, menu items. And you can also just assign something that just fits your style and something that just like use your color palette. But at the end of the day, you want it to be highly visible, uh, highly visible from the rest of the content because it's telling you you are here and this is what you're going to do. So for example, here we have, uh, we can just add a, a, an outline or hard shadow to our links and buttons. Uh, for example, that's a default, but if we want to make it more uh, aligned with our brand, let's say, uh, why not do something like that? And if you want to even go a step further and differentiate what is active and what is selective, you can add something more like this. So, uh, oh yeah, and or something more like that. I don't know. Those are examples. So, uh, for example, you can add an outline or heart shadow. This is uh, from Box, and here it's just a very subtle, but it's really clear too that when you're navigating uh, between the links. This is from Box. Okay, number four, label your forms. And super quick on this one, just the form, uh, forms, you want to help understand people what they should do and write in a form. I don't know if you have uh, done this, but uh, uh, the placeholder text is does not equal labels. Uh, when you're designing a form, we might be tempted to just like uh, get rid of some stuff and use a minimal design, and uh, we end up without labels. The thing is that labels uh, uh, are what are re read by screen readers. So uh, the label, the form field, uh, the placeholder text is not read by a, by a screen reader. So this is read and that's not red. So if you get rid of the label, then suddenly you don't even know, uh, people that are used as screen readers don't know what they're filling up. So just don't sacrifice usability in favor of simplicity. So this is probably, it looks nice, it looks simple, it looks minimal, uh, but suddenly, even for me, I don't know if you've ever done this where you start typing and you, you, you don't remember, hold on, was this the email or was this the, the name? And you have to go back to read the, 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 the placeholder text. So just, uh, just very simple stuff, just add a, just add a label. Uh, yeah, there you go. Now I know what, I, what the hell I was typing. <laughs> don't clutter. I mean, you don't have to do it like this either. <laughs> so because this actually, the goal is to make sure that the user has enough information because if you have too much information, then it's actually even worse. Okay, write useful alt text for your images. And the idea here is there are two ways that you can present alternative text within the alt attribute or in context with the surroundings. So for example, we have here a cute, uh, a, a picture of a bear. Uh, you, can, you can be a little more specific and tell the story that, hey, it is a cute bear. But probably uh, for someone that cannot see the bear, they think, well, a cute bear, what? So then you can say, hey, it's a cute bear that runs through the park. You can tell a story if it is important for the story and this is not being told already in the text, then uh, say it and you can use the alt text to do that. The worst that you can do is not do anything, forget about the alt text, and then a screen reader will read this. 
bear.compress.jpg, and that's not cool because that doesn't tell the story and it's, it kind of sucks. But sometimes uh, you don't want to, the, the, the images are just decoration. So if it, they're just decoration, or if the context is already explained in the text, then just use an empty alt. Alt equals, and then the, the, those things. What do you call these? Quotation marks, yes. Okay, almost there. Use correct markup. So well-structured HTML is like the secret weapon of web accessibility. If anything, the web was already accessible, and then designers we just came and ruin it. But this is accessible, and it's readable, and it's clear, uh, and that's it. We can go home and, and just ship it like that. <laughs> Brutal is the sign, yo. Uh, but uh, no, but the idea here is that HTML uh, uh, talks to the browser, and then the browser talks to an accessibility tree. And the components and structure of a page are what arranges this accessibility tree. So because blind people listen to a page, they don't see it, they listen to it. So this tree is what powers the screen readers, and then they can listen to it. You know when people, here's the thing, you know when people tell jokes out of order, or they just like tell you the punchline first, and then they, they try to explain it? That's kind of when you don't use correct HTML or something like that. So probably you started with lawsuits. Wait, wait, what? It's like, lawsuits, get it? What, what, what are you talking about? You know, what, law, what lawyers were to court, dude. So that's the same if you're not using HTML, uh, uh, a well-structured HTML. You just start with the punchline. Here we have, uh, for example, this is, let's say that this is, these are the news, and this is the website. You might be tempted to use the default styles and say, hey, well, the first one over there, the, the headline, uh, we, we have the section header, we have the title of the article, and then we have the article, the content. And probably you will say, well, this one is bigger, so I'm going to use an H1. Uh, and probably over there an H2, and then over here the paragraph. Well, a screen reader will start reading this stuff, then this stuff, and then at the end of, of everything, it will tell you, oh, the news. So, uh, so <laughs> what you actually want to do is say, that's an H1, that is styled differently with CSS, and then the next one is an H2, that is styled bigger than the H1, it's okay with CSS, but semantically, it's okay. And probably we can also wrap it around an article. So yeah, the idea is don't use HTML tags just for a style effect only. For example, here's an example from the BBC. By the way, you can use these kind of tools where it just like removes all the CSS. Do that with your sites. Remove the CSS and see if it's still readable. And if it's still readable and if it's still like clear, then it, it will still it will be clear uh, for people that uh, have a screen reader. So it, it, there you go. That's great. Last but not least, support keyboard navigation. And I was talking about the focus stays on how to use it. Uh, but the idea here is that keyboard accessibility is one of the most crit critical access of uh, uh, accessibility. Users with motor disabilities, uh, people with low vision, that rely on screen readers, people that don't have uh, a precise muscle control, and even power users are dependent on the keyboard to navigate content. Because I don't know if you do this, but uh, we tap, 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 and then we go from links, buttons, input fields, just different components. And just mind the order, logical order, how it's visually presented, also put it semantically, one, two, three, four, up, down, left, to right. Test with your keyboard and you should be fine. If it makes sense with your keyboard, it should be make, make, making sense for someone with a screen reader. And that's it. Conclusion, seven guidelines that will help you make your work a little bit more accessible. Hopefully, with the recap, you see that there's a myth. You understand why you go with your team and tell them, guys, we can do this. You can champion accessibility and understand that it's a work in progress. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm still learning um, uh, and, and, and I invite you to learn yourself. Uh, there's some tools there. Probably you can take some photos. I'm going to share this uh, uh, keynote too, so if you want to get all the tools. Uh, and there are tools too, uh, for example, Stark, Contrast App, Color, Color Box by Lip, and I just invite you to design responsibly. And that's it. Gracias.